Welcome. I'm Nicholas Creel, an assistant professor of business law and ethics at Georgia College and State University's J. Whitney Bunting College of Business. I'm here today as a moderator at a roundtable discussion that we've titled Doing Business in the Time of COVID-19. It's our hope that the material we're covering here today can be some help in helping you navigate these very uniquely challenging times. Joining with me today to help accomplish that, we have three panelists. First off, we've got Jahan Eljabagi, Assistant Professor of Business Law and Ethics, also here at Georgia College and State University with me. Say hello, Jahan. Hello, glad to be here. All right. We've also got Eric Wilhall, an Assistant Professor of Management, again here with me from Georgia College and State University. Eric? Hello, everyone. And joining us from the uh, Terry College of Business at UGA, also a local attorney here in Milledgeville, we've got Matt Ressing. Say hello, Matt. Hello. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and just get right into the good stuff. The first question I've got here is for Eric. The question I'm directing to you is, how can businesses stay open while also keeping employees and customers assured of their safety? That's a great question, Nick. And hopefully I sound like a broken record with this first part that I talk about, right? So number one, I'd say signage, right? Hopefully you've been shopping in local businesses and trying to be safe at the same time, but hopefully you've noticed plenty of signage and policies before you even walk in that front door. So this would be the broken record part. You as a business, I would highly encourage you to not only first of all post a sign warning people that have experienced any symptoms or been around anyone that has tested positive to simply stay at home please don't enter that place of business. And you as the business owner should hopefully have that signage uh, in a visible location on that door before anyone even enters. I think it also helps to have policies, right? Have policies that warn people, please wear a mask. Uh, when you are in this, in this business, try to social distance, right? Try to try your best to stay six feet apart. Um, and then of course, again, as a business owner inside the location, feel free to offer hand sanitizer, feel free to offer uh, stickers on the floor that help people to social distance when they're in line, uh, ready to pay their bill and things like that. So hopefully none of these are surprising. Hopefully they're all things you've heard of, but that would be my advice to these uh, local businesses. Maybe go out, do a little shopping, see what others are doing. If you think they're doing a great job, go ahead and copy that, right? Implement some of these best practices. Otherwise, I'd definitely encourage you to take some of those practices I said, if you realize your fellow business people might not uh, have that signage and be enforcing those kinds of policies. Excellent, thank you. All right, now speaking of that, when you're talking about like all the different things they're doing, uh, masks are a big part of this. So Matt, question for you. Can a business really be forced to make their customers wear masks? Uh, yes, uh, state governments, I think, can force businesses to uh, require masks. And I look at this akin to uh, no smoking laws. So for example, a state government or a local government could say that you're not allowed to have smoking in your restaurant and they could come in there and find someone, even if the restaurant proprietor themselves is okay with it, still against the law. Now that said, Georgia has not done this. Uh, the state of Georgia has not forced or required businesses to uh, have their customers wear masks. And in fact, in Georgia, the Georgia state government through a governor's executive order has actually prohibited local governments from putting uh, those sort of rules in place. So we just had a recent executive order. We've, we've had a series of executive orders that have really set the state law uh, regarding masks and other uh, requirements for business reopening. And the latest one says that uh, local governments, if uh, they can assist a business owner, if the business owner wants to enforce masks. So each business owner can decide, I want this, I want all my customers, everyone entering this place has to wear a mask. And if they say that, local law enforcement can back them up. Um, but if that local uh, business owner does not want enforcement on their property, then the local authorities are not allowed to enforce it. So you're saying if I've got a customer that comes in, my mask policy is you've got to wear one at my business, and they say, no, I can call the cops on them? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and there are limits in the governor's order of what the cops can do in this case. 
Uh, the first step is an educational piece. You know, we're not trying to put anyone in jail or even jump straight to the fine. So the first step is supposed to be explain to them the, the health risks and offer them a mask. So businesses and law enforcement are encouraged to have masks on hand so they can offer it to the person. Um, and we don't know their circumstances, so it, you have, have one available. If they still refuse, though, uh, they could be escorted off the premises. It's essentially a trespass. Uh, as with any business rules, like no shirt, no shoes, no service. If you're not following the rules established by that private property owner, uh, then you are trespassing on their property. Uh, and furthermore, uh, you could be fined up to $50 uh, for that infraction. Excellent. All right. Nicholas, could now, I oh. add in a bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you mind if I? No, Jan, please go. Yeah. Here? Okay. I, on two things. One, Eric was talking about signage and appropriate signage. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a lot of comical signs as well. They still convey the message really well and sometimes even better. So I just also want to encourage businesses that as long as you're conveying the message that needs to be conveyed, you can do so in a funny way. I, for instance, I saw one that sort of got a lot of hits on social media, which said masks are the new bra. They're uncomfortable <laughs> and everyone notices when you don't wear it but it's what we should do right now, you know? So it's funny, it's catchy, um, but it, it still conveys the message of wanting you, the people who come into your business to wear a mask. And then in regards to what Matt was just saying about this sort of succession of executive orders, um, the current uh, rule, just to be clear, is that the one that came out on Saturday from the governor mm -hmm. does um, allow local governments to have mask ordinances. No, okay, I'm just going to jump right to a question then, because there's a lot going on here in terms of one level of government says X, another level says Y, as you had alluded to both now, they're not always in compliance with one another. So what do we do when those two conflict, Jahan? Like, what am I supposed to do as a business owner when I'm hearing X from my mayor and Y from my governor? Right. Okay, so up till Saturday, there was this conflict where the city of Atlanta Athens, Savannah had passed local mask requirements for their municipalities. Then most people saw on the news that the governor specifically prohibited localities from having mask ordinances. And then that, that led to a conflict between the mayor of Atlanta and the governor, which then they entered into settlement negotiations. On Saturday, the uh, executive order that was passed by the gov governor specifically allows now local governments to have mask requirements so long as the transmission is above a certain threshold. And I think, so you we're going to get a little visit from a, a three-year-old here. I apologize. Always welcome. Uh, always yeah, this welcome. is how Zoom world works. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, we're going to have, maybe Matt, can you continue and I'll try to handle my, my children here. Sure. Um, so, I mean, generally speaking, federal law beats state law, state law beats local law. Now, the federal law has to have been passed lawfully. The state law has to have been passed lawfully. But as long as the governor's orders were valid, then they would supersede any local lawyer, any local laws that contradict them. Well, I'll throw another little curveball out there at you then. What is stopping a federal mask mandate? Why don't we, if, what, if, what if the president tomorrow, we know he likes to tweet, what if a tweet comes through that says, I hereby order that all Americans, when in public, must wear a mask. What does that do to my state law? What does that do to my local law? What, does that change anything? I'm back. Can I answer that one? Go for Can, it. take it. <laughs> okay. So um, we have this concept in this, the supremacy clause in the Constitution that if federal law and state law conflict, that federal law is the one that's going to, and unintentionally I'm going to use the word trump, okay? So uh, federal law is going to trump state law when the two conflict. And so there's actually a, an equivalent at the state local level. So when state and local laws conflict, state is the one that's going to carry the power and the weight. Uh, so if Trump tweeted, um, which would not be unusual, I suppose, um, then federal law is the one that would be as long as it, is, it falls within his yeah. constitutional duty and, and that would be my question then yeah that's, that's the key part here um you know is it a lawful would that be within the federal government's powers i think it would not 
Um, so the powers of the federal government are limited. Uh, you know, they're set forth in the Constitution. And I actually think the mandating of a mask would probably, it's certainly not one of the enumerated powers of the federal government and the Constitution. And I think that would, uh, would lose a, uh, what, we, what lawyers would call a federalism challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, states, however, have what's called police power, which is a very broad power to regulate health, welfare, and safety. So I think the states pretty clearly do have that power, at least in my opinion, the federal government does not. Well, to nerd out on you then, let's say Trump tries it, but it fails that challenge. Well, let's say then the Democrats go, but you know what, we're actually going to take Trump's side for the first time probably in a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say, we pass the law and it goes through Congress. Is there any way that would have any better chance of making it? Or would you think, no, still? No, same federalism problems. It doesn't matter whether the president does it or Congress does it. Um, if it's not one of the uh, powers granted to the federal government, the Constitution, they, they can't do it. My own two cents on it. I think you're probably right. I think the best chance at them getting it, though, would maybe be to try to go through that interstate commerce clause, something we've seen very often over time uh, justify all sorts of, of laws and regulations at the federal level. But even then, I'm just not so sure it would, it would be enough in these times. Well, you know, I think uh, maybe people need to tune into Georgia College's Constitution Week, which is uh, coming up. Uh, in, in a month or so, because we're going to be talking about the Supreme Court and particularly Chief Justice John Roberts. And uh, John Roberts has always been very suspicious about that expansion of the Commerce Clause. So I, I, I do think you're right that that has been a, uh, a, a great argument in the past. Uh, people have used the Commerce Clause to justify federal power, you know, in almost everything. But uh, I think John Roberts has been trying to put a stop to that recently. Most definitely, yeah. Well, then the other thing I then would have to ask is, this one's again to the entire panel, how do I make sure I'm following all these regulations that seem to be changing by the day? Literally before we started this, I just saw that the city of Milledgeville passed some new mask ordinance. How can I possibly, unless I'm just dedicated to keeping up with this news all the time, how can I figure out what's going on and what the laws are even? Oh, I think there's two things. One, you either have a great HR person who is abreast with what's going on and on a professional um, chat where they're constantly pushing out these notifications and keeping up with it. So one is the HR person. And the second for these smaller businesses is having a lawyer who you can consult on a weekly basis at this point to give you updates. I think it is important to have legal counsel at this time. And I think there's a lot of um, attorneys who are specialized in this area, who are willing to give advice in a concise way so as not to charge too much. Definitely. With, with the governor's executive orders, I think they were very confusing in the first few weeks that they started to roll out. Mm -hmm. I think now they've coalesced to the point where it's not so much an excuse anymore. Um, the, uh, you know, the most recent governor's order, uh, which I think was on the 15th, really goes through every single type of business and says, all right, here are, are the rules. Uh, so it would be hard for anyone to keep all of those in their head. But if you run a gym, if you run a bowling alley, if you run a tattoo parlor, you can look it up on the governor's website. It's all there. Also, a lot of localities like the city of Milledgeville have posted summaries on their websites. And local law enforcement, at least from what I've seen, they're not trying to get anybody. Uh, and, the, and the city of Milledgeville is an example. You know, right now they're really on an educational kick to go around and inform businesses. Okay, you're this type of business. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And we're going to be checking up on you. They're not rushing to find anyone. So perhaps the best way to do it is keep a good relationship with your local law enforcement and your, your uh, you know, local city council. And they will let you know, you know, not just what you're supposed to be doing, but how enforcement is going to work in your community, which, which can vary. And I would add to Jay Han's comment. Uh, she said a good lawyer or a good HR person who's able to keep up on all of these changing updates. My only advice there would be uh, if you are an HR professional, there's a Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, which hopefully you've heard about if you are an HR person. Um, but then there's also companies such as Mercer, right? The world's largest HR consulting firm. If you go out to either one of these entities' websites, I have no doubt you can sign up for emails that they'll push into your, into 
your inbox. And I have no doubt a lot of those uh, emails that they would push to you are keeping up to date on many of these topics that we're discussing, uh, changing laws and regulations. Uh, the only caveat, I guess, would be that uh, Georgia law or local law, that might not be covered by these uh, large entities. So get to know your local professional organization or association. I'm sure they can help you try to keep on top of all of this. Definitely. Local chambers of commerce are also a great source of information on these subjects. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Another question that I throw out to all the, uh, the panelists here. What's my liability if my employees or my customers get sick because they went to my business, either as a customer or because they work there? Who wants to tackle that one? Uh, I'll, I'll start off. So this sort of lawsuit would, would normally fall under the, uh, the, the uh, ambit of negligence. This is a negligence type of lawsuit, uh, saying that you didn't take reasonable care to protect me from some danger. And in a negligence lawsuit, you have to show that the business owner uh, acted unreasonably, either the way they acted or the way they failed to act was unreasonable. And that that unreasonable action or inaction then caused your harm. So a plaintiff is going to have an uphill climb in bringing that against the business, if only because they're going to have to prove that they contracted COVID at your business and nowhere else. That alone makes it pretty daunting. Uh, well, so Matt's talking about a negligence claim, but in some ways I think there's, there's a small possibility in certain circumstances, for instance, a, a packed bar or a packed restaurant, like for instance, if you're not complying with health regulations, state or, or local, and uh, for instance, you have an employee who comes in and wants to wear a mask um, to protect him or herself. And you as the supervisor say, no, you're not wearing that mask on my premises. And the employee says, well, it's packed in here. There are people everywhere. They're not wearing masks. What am I gonna do? And the employer says, you need to go out there and do your job. And I'm telling you go out there without a mask because for some reason, however that position, I don't want you don't want a front-facing employee to show cowardice or whatever the reason. Right, or whatever the <laughs> justification might be. I think in that case, there is the possibility for an intentional tort that you intentionally put someone in danger, um, which is, even, and this is like the workers' comp kind of concept. So workers' comp usually covers all kinds of negligence cases. But if you are acting intentionally and you put your, your employee in harm's way intentionally, there's a possibility there's a lawsuit beyond workers' comp. But is there still not a causation element that Matt was speaking to? How do I prove as the employee who wanted to wear the mask that I caught it from my job and not when I went to the gym later or when I was walking down the street? Right. That's really, so of course that's really difficult, but in terms of like, if that person wears, wore a mask everywhere else he went, and then assuming that we have any kind of contract tracing that's viable, uh, that there's a cluster that's identified at that particular bar, that particular restaurant that is followed closely, then there's a possibility that there could be some causal chain established. And I think the businesses that have the most to fear from this are places that, you know, healthcare uh, institutions, places where you could say, I'm a nurse working with COVID patients. I wasn't provided the correct PPE. Um, you know, remember a lot of these cases, the end result is before a jury. Uh, so cases that are sympathetic to a jury uh, may play well. Uh, and that's actually the fear of business owners uh, with this liability is not that they're going to lose the case, but that, uh, you know, there's at least enough factual, uh, you know, uh, confusion that it has to go into the discovery phase of a lawsuit. And that can be very expensive. And some businesses will pay a settlement just to avoid that. So uh, the state of Georgia has got your back, uh, business uh, owners. They passed a statute uh, recently, and it was signed by the governor to say that if, a, uh, if a, a client or a customer, someone that comes into a business sues, they don't get the normal negligence standard. Uh, we're going to hold them to a gross negligence standard, which is kind of the, uh, the situation Jahan presented where you are showing willful and wanton disregard for the health of someone, you know, get out there mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't care uh, whether you get sick. Uh, that's the sort of lawsuit that could uh, still be in play 
under this new Georgia statute. Although to make it even harder for people to sue, uh, Georgia also said in that law that businesses could put up a sign, and you're probably seeing these signs pop up mm -hmm. all around town, uh, that basically warns people, uh, you know, Georgia has no liability for people that, you know, that get injured due to the inherent risks of COVID-19 or something like that. Uh, they have special language, some magic words, and even a magic font. You have to use aerial font for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> if you put up that sign, um, then the courts are instructed to apply a uh, assumption of risk defense and say you basically knew what you were getting into. You now, this would that? not apply to employees. This would only apply to, to guests or, uh, or uh, clients. Uh, as Jahan mentioned, employees are covered under a separate area of the law called workers' comp. So what Matt is saying really circles back to Eric's first advice of putting that signage out, mm -hmm. including that, that when you enter our premises, you need to understand that there's the possibility that this could occur and you are not going to sue uh, or you, you're holding us harmless, essentially, that assumption of risk language. And in addition to that assumption of risk language, if you want to try to minimize your liability, the more that you're following those health standards recommended by the state and local, the better position you'll be in, the easier it'll be to dismiss any kind of potential lawsuit really quickly. And so I, I, the more that you just follow those the guidelines, and it's, it's fairly straightforward, you can find it yourself, you don't necessarily have to go to an attorney, the better you'll be. Excellent. Good to know. Uh, well, Jan, now that I've got you, the next question I have is to you. Can the government really force my business to shut down? If we have another shutdown, let's say Georgia right now, we are the Trump administration just called us out as the worst performing state right now when it comes to COVID. It's, it's in an active outbreak. So can they really shut us down again, even if it means I go bankrupt? Can they take that livelihood away from me? So the assessment on Georgia is that we have the highest per capita in terms of transmission. And uh, can the government shut us down or shut you down in a health emergency? Yes. Even if I go bankrupt and I become destitute, they can just tell my business you're not allowed to, to operate? Like, how? It has happened. This is not a what if. This is, this is what's happened to businesses in other places and probably even in Georgia already. Um, the impact that it's had on tourism, and hotels, and restaurants, and these, um, you know, customer direct businesses um, that have been hit not just by closures, but just people not wanting to go out. Um, it's just the reality of this pandemic. Um, and so if, if the company um, fails to adhere to the safety regulations, then yes, it is a possibility. I'm sorry to say, I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing. This is a lot, so many hard decisions that are having to be made by not just individuals, but of course, businesses and corporations. And a lot of companies are shifting and a lot of small businesses are being creative in in finding different ways to service their customers. Um, and so I think this is a great time for entrepreneurs. This is a great way, time for um, small business people who wanna think creatively to try to have not just all their eggs in one basket, to try to figure out different ways to, um, you know, send out the product and to, to uh, work with their customers. And something I'd add to that, I mean, when it looks to it legally, it does seem, right, we are just out of luck. But it's not just law, there's also politics. Because ultimately, it's a political decision, what we shut down, when we shut down, if we even do. And so the thing I would go ahead and suggest to everyone, too, is call your representatives. Uh, when Congress passed, like the PPP loans and whatnot, there's nothing stopping another round from happening again. And that also applies to, as Matt was saying, how the state of Georgia passed liability coverage. There's nothing stopping Congress from passing even more sort of protections. Uh, so people be politically active. This is the kind of thing when, if you know you can't win legally, fight it politically would be my, my two cents on that. Next up, I'd ask Matt now, what sort of government assistance available is there for me right now? Uh, well, not a lot right now, unfortunately. Uh, there were a number of uh, stimulus programs that were put in place under the CARES Act Mm -hmm. uh, which was a recent federal bill. Uh, however, most of those are now either depleted or the time has expired. So one of them you mentioned already, the Paycheck Protection Program, which tried to uh, basically help businesses uh, keep their employees on, keep their employees hired. 
um, during the pandemic when a lot of these businesses were shutting down. Uh, there were a number of issues with that program though. Uh, you know, there was a lot of confusing uh, rules in the rollout. Uh, not only do you have, a, you have a federal statute that says what should be done, but then you have federal agencies that actually have to implement that and they have their own rules. So there was a lot of confusion among small businesses as to whether they were eligible for this. Um, it, it, in the early iterations, it really incentivized you to keep your employees employed. And when businesses were completely shut down, they said, you know, I, I can't keep them employed. So um, over time, that program was adjusted till it got better and better and more and more helpful. Uh, but then it ended. And it ended with still $100 billion left in the pot, left to be allocated. So there's a big question of what will happen with that next. And right now there is bipartisan support for a new round of PPP funding or, uh, or at least a new round of funding using that money. Um, but they're really bickering over the details. There's a big, a wide gulf between the uh, you know, largely the Republican controlled Senate and the Democratic controlled House in exactly how much money is going to be in this next bill. Uh, how much money is going to go to local governments and schools. So some of the things they agree, exactly how much uh, unemployment benefits will be increased. So even though there's a lot of things they agree on, this desire for a overarching bill um, that is still very contentious means that we don't know uh, when the next round of funding will come. Another very popular uh, loan program that, uh, that was used earlier in the pandemic was the EIDL loan or the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, uh, but all that money has now been allocated. So we're really waiting, uh, you know, maybe even within next, the next week uh, to hear from the federal government as to whether we'll see a next round of stimulus. In the meantime, there are some local options. I know in Milledgeville, uh, the uh, Milledgeville Main Street program, which is uh, part of or in, uh, our, our local government, the city of Milledgeville, is offering some small grants to local businesses. Uh, so cities may have some loan programs for their businesses. And there's a lot to explore. Uh, there are, uh, you know, you can look on the, uh, uh, <clears throat> there's a uh, Georgia Small Business Development Center, which is run by UGA, has a lot of resources for small businesses, including some information about, uh, about local loan programs. But as far as those big federal programs, we're, we have to wait and see. Yeah, last I'd seen, there were still about, what, $2 trillion apart on the deal. Not, not a small number whatsoever. And so it is indeed a gulf that we just don't have a good answer for, as far as I've seen, for when or if it will even become available. All right. Well, that's all we have for you today. We hope that this was some help to those watching. And uh, we thank you very much for your time, everyone who joined me today. Thank you.